You're stunning in how you move. And, and every single one of us, Lord, caught in our own sin, we need a pardon from you. A pardon that you purchased at your own cost, at your own life, with your own blood on your own cross. Not your own grave, though, because you didn't need to keep that. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose again as you promised and that you cause any of us that believe in your name to have eternal life in a place you've prepared for us. But living God, we needed a pardon. And in your great mercy, you gave it if we're just willing to accept it. That's just how easy you've made it. We love you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you live inside. Open up this word. It's your word. It's you, Jesus. You said you're one with your word. It's you. Speak to us today. Thank you. Amen. Acts 16, starting at verse 16, reads like this. Once, and it's, and it's Luke, the doctor, that writes Acts and writes the Gospel of Luke, and he's writing this right now. It was so awesome of God to put a doctor with Paul since everybody beats him up. You know, all through Acts, every missionary journey he goes, people throwing rocks at him and dragging him out of town and doing bad stuff to him. And so he's like, I, you need a doctor, man. <laughs> so I felt about my daughter, like, you really need a doctor. And, uh, and, and, and so she, you know... Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit, a demon really, by which she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. All right, just a note. I'm going to break this all up today, so I'm not going to promise you anything like... Demons can't predict the future. God knows the future. God can look down the road and he can tell you who's going to accept him and who's not. Like I've said before, he said to the 12 apostles who were disciples first and then apostles, didn't I know one of you was a devil and yet I still picked all 12 of you and I knew one of you was a devil. I knew one of you would betray me. I knew one of you would betray me at the worst possible time, and I still picked you. I still gave you power in my kingdom. I still loved you right to the end, and you still could have had freedom from your sin if you hadn't gone and hung yourself. I could forgive you, and you couldn't forgive yourself, but I picked you, all 12 of you, and I knew one of you was a devil. How would he know that? How could he know? Well, he writes Revelation. He tells you everything that's going to happen. He knows. He's a God that looks down the road. Revelation says from the beginning, the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. He knew what he was going to do and what would have to happen because he knew what we were going to do. He could see it. He's a God that doesn't live in this linear time like we do. He's outside of it. He's calling us to that. He lives outside of it. We're just like on the straight line and we can't see the future. We can make educated guesses. So can demons. But don't miss this. Someone who's been living a lot longer, they can make better educated guesses than a young person. An older person will be like, it'll be July and they're like, yeah, Christmas right around the corner. You're like, shut up. It's summer. What's the matter with you? Seasons start to be, you know, become like weeks. You, know, you, just, you just look down the road. You know what's coming next. You get used to a pattern. You see certain things. Dad would just call stuff in friends of mine and be like, oh, they're going to do this. And they'd do it. I'd be like, how would you know that? What, how, do you, how do you predict stuff like that? He's like, oh, I just seen it. Saw a look in his eye. Saw a pattern of behavior. And make educated guesses because you see it over and over. That's what demons do. The demons have an upper hand in trying to guess the future. Because demons help the future happen. They start whispering in your head. They start saying things that you listen to. 
And when you are just driving down the street and all of a sudden from your house to Hannaford, you've gotten into a horrible place. And you're like, well, how did I get here? What was it, a bulletin board? Or someone said something at church and now I hate their guts and I don't even know if they meant that. Yeah. What do you think's happening? You think that's you? A demon is whispering thoughts and sitting shotgun with you and telling you things you ought to be thinking. And they're brilliant. They've been th at this for thousands of years. Where do you think they came from? The devil took a third of the angels who tried to work with him to overthrow God, and God threw them all down. I don't know why he threw them here. So <laughs> you had the whole universe. Could you put them on Pluto? You know, I mean, we don't need them here. We don't need this, you know, and, and this aggravation. And, and demons can help things happen that they want to happen. And if you're not careful, they'll do it through you. They don't have to possess you. They just have to possess some of your time. Just give them your thought. Just keep walking down that road with them until they get you doing something you didn't want to do. They're brilliant people. They're brilliant, comma, people. Demons are devious. And they have no hope. They know who they're fighting against. Every time you see one around Jesus, they freak all out. They are petrified of that name. We carry that name if you believe in Jesus Christ, and he lives in you. Light and darkness can't dwell in the same place. But don't miss this. You'll see Satan right in Jesus' presence and right in the throne room of God talking to him. You find him in Job. You find him tempting Jesus in Gethsemane. You see him tempting him at the beginning of his ministry and trying to derail it. He'll be right there. Once Jesus says, enough, get out, he whimpers like a dog and runs away, but he has been given opportune times, and it is important for you to fight. That's how your faith builds. But they, 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 these owners of this slave girl that has the ability to predict the future are making a great deal of money, not because she can predict the future, but because she's in touch with demons that help the future happen. And she's got a whole bunch of chaos all around her in the Roman world where people, Gentiles everywhere, have no idea who God is and a bunch of Jews who aren't listening anymore. And so they've got all kinds of all kinds of material to work with to make stuff happen. She's making money off of this. She isn't. She's making nothing. The people that own her are making money off of this. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. You'd think, wow, that's helpful. That's exactly who we are. We're working for the Most High God, and we're telling you, everyone, how to be saved. Thank you. You're like my hype man. Go, girl. You know? They're telling you how to be saved. Go. Boom. Most High God. Got it. Jesus had demons doing that all the time. Oh, I know who you are. You're the son of God. You're the, he's the son of God, everyone. Son of God. They do that. He says, shut up. Come out. He wouldn't even let them speak. You want to know why? Because you don't want demons advertising the kingdom ever. Listen to that. You don't want demons advertising the kingdom. You don't want demon and demonic thought process advertising the God of love. Why? Because they turn it into lust. They turn it into power, not authority. They turn it from love to lust. They turn it from, from, from um, humility to pride, to false humility. Everything they do is a slight twist to it. They look like they're doing what they should be doing, and then they twist it. That's how they got kicked out in the first place. This is what they do. Never, ever do you want your church advertised by non-Christian anything. 
You don't want the demons to have control of who's advertising the church. You know, that's kind of harsh. It is not harsh. It's a reality, and God doesn't ever put up with it walking around as Jesus. And Paul doesn't put up with it. Why? Because it's always twisted. It'll always go down a twisted road. It, uh, hey, we're, we're, we're really, we, in the name of love, we should do this. In the name of love, you should accept anyone's sins. It's just love. We can't. You love the sinner, but you can't just excuse the sin like it's nothing. You love the sinner because you're one too, saved by grace. So with the measuring rod you use, you'll be measured with it. So I suggest you love the sinner. But we have an authority over us who says, don't accept sin, though. Love, but live by the truth. And don't accept sin. What do you do, just reject people? No, you reject the sin. Fine line. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. You know when she's yelling that? Probably he's making a good point. If you're in the body of Christ, you hate it when someone quotes some pastor somewhere who's right off the rails. And believe me, that will make the news. It'll be the world advertising the church. It'll make the news. There'll be pastors that say ridiculous things. They have nothing to do with the word of God, and their behavior is abhorrent to the king. They're not even really a pastor. They just hold that position. But not in the kingdom they don't. And they will say or do things that will get noticed and they'll quote scripture and then twist it the same way Satan does because it's Satan doing it. And God, and, and you and you and you and I will watch one of those things on TV and go, ah, no, 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 I don't want everybody, all my friends who I've been inviting to church to see that guy. You don't want the kingdom illustrated or even, even celebrated by Satan because he's only doing it to twist it. All right. She kept this up for many days. And I, I don't, this might be the only time that you find the word annoyed in the scripture. I got to look it up. I got to look it up. But you, you know, they're dealing with such heavy duty things that using an annoyance isn't one of them. You know, just annoyed. But, you know, Paul deals with people. In the last city he visited, that's where they stoned him five years prior. And he comes back and he's like, hey, hey, I'm still hoping the church is doing fine here. I know what you guys do to people when they believe in Jesus. And, and, and he comes back to it. And so he's dealing with huge things. But finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, not so filled with the Holy Spirit, not so holy, not so powerful in the kingdom, just, I, I can't take it! Shut up! Stop yelling that every time I teach! You, stop! She, finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her! At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. When men use women for their own advantage, for their own financial gain. It is a tool for their financial gain. When men do that, they come out ready to kill 
anyone who's stopping the pimping process. They come out ready to kill anyone because they don't care about the woman. There's nothing as a tool for them to get whatever they want. They, they treat women like a tool to get what they want. They'll be heavily punished. But they see their chance of making money's gone. They screwed up their slave girl. She can't, she can't predict the future anymore. I don't know how they saw that so fast. Like, I, I don't know if they did like a magic eight ball test on her just to see if she could still do it right after she, he's told her the, the demon to leave. You know, ch -ch -ch, not sure. Ch -ch -ch -ch, ask later. Ch -ch -ch. Okay, oh, she can't do it. <laughs> like, I don't know how they knew. They immediately knew. I mean, I think they probably just saw. I'll tell you how they knew. The thing commanded her life, and, and she's suddenly free to not talk to them anymore. She probably stood up. They brought them before the magistrate. Oh, I'm sorry. They seized Paul and Silas, and they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. What is going on? They don't even have any kind of an accurate accusation. They advocate stuff we don't like. We'll beat them with rods then. Thank you, judge. Clink. Like, how does that work? That's, that's your justice system? We don't like what they're doing. Yeah, us either. Well, let's hurt them. That doesn't, that doesn't, like these are magistrates. These are people with the authority to make judgments. And they totally just accept that. that that's good enough. All they needed was a crowd. They're advocating customs unlawful for us. They don't explain what they are. They don't explain how the city's in an uproar. They don't explain anything. All they're mad about is they can't make their money and they can't use this woman anymore. That's what they're ticked about. And because there's a good old boys club in this area, they're like, yeah, yeah, it makes us mad too. We can't let these guys go any further. Beat them. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, the magistrates are going to order for them to be beaten and stripped and stripped and beaten with rods. That's a flogging. They're going to either do it with whips, with those little pieces of glass and shells that are real sharp on the end and metal, and so it scrapes all your skin up, or they're going to hit you with actual rods and, until, until it cuts. Not rods like big thick rods. You're not bringing up like a Louisville slugger. It's more thin, like that thing, and it just cuts. The kind of stick you didn't get your parents when they told you, go get a stick out back. You're, you're about to get spanked. No, not that one. Who do you think's going to beat them? The magistrates aren't going to do it. They got hangmen. They got people whose only job is to do this. And it's the people that run the jails. So they get in touch with the jailer and say, flog these guys. They're causing a big disturbance. Watch this. After they had been severely flogged. I always, oh, that's always rough when they add that adjective, uh, adverb, adverb severely. Flogged. Because a flogging is a severe beating by definition. So you've been severely, severely beaten. That's really, that's extreme. They've done nothing. What got them to this place? Obedience to God. What got them severely, severely flogged? Bleeding and put in prison. Obedience to the king of kings. And so you would think... Because this is what happens with us. You would think they would be like, man, see, that's why I don't like serving you. I go around and I do right stuff 
and people take shots at me and throw stones at me and hit me with rods and put me in jail. That's why I don't want to do this anymore. It's frustrating. I, I don't want to just serve you. You say, oh, love, love, love. Well, what about them? What about the other ones who are supposed to be doing this with me? And then they take shots at me. What about that, God? You don't even get a hint of that. Because these people are not Americans. I got rights. Don't talk to me like that. I'm a Christian. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So, okay, here's the rules. Beat them with rods after stripping them, throw them into prison, and guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. The purpose of this, by the way, one is so you can't get away, obviously. I mean, it's kind of overkill. You're in a cell, and then your feet are in stocks in the cell. It's like, what do you think I can do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm already in a cell. But, the, but they could incrementally increase the stocks. There was not just two holes, and it's just a one-size-fits-all deal. You could keep incrementally making it be wider and less comfortable and harder to be there. It's a punishment. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. <laughs> not Americans. It's not who they are. They are used to being attacked for their faith and you will even find them thanking God for it and saying, I don't think I have used enough of my privilege for suffering for you, Jesus. I haven't. So I need to fill up in my flesh what I haven't suffered enough for you so that I'm worthy of being in your kingdom. They say stuff like this. Every one of these guys is going to die a martyr. Every one of them. And we're all church hurt. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm beginning to hate that word. And I'm, I'm trying to be gentle about it because I know it's a real thing. I know it's a real thing. I've been there and I get it. I've been there recently. And I get it. But enough with the church hurt mentality. The church is going to get hurt. The church will even hurt the church. The reason they will do it is because of demons. They can predict what you're going to do by whispering to you and then watching you and whispering to you and then watching you and doing this for years and years and eons and millennium. They've been here as long as you are, the same ones. They don't die and get born again and die and get born again, or die and then another one born, die and then another one. They're the same ones. They've been watching all this time. You think they don't know what you knee-jerk move towards? Humans? They know. All they got to do is watch. Which kind are you? Are you a lustful one? Okay, I, get, I know how to get you. Are you a, a money guy? Oh, I can easily get you. Are you a pride guy? Oh, yeah, I can get you in a crowd. Are you, are you attention-seeking? You need that? You're super attention-needy? Yep, I got you. They just watch. That's all they got to do. Just watch. And then go after they're brilliant, devious, horrible, and brilliant. And they've been around forever. Even the dumb ones are getting smarter. And they get all of us. Many people who are church hurt will be hurt by someone who's super sad they did it, but neither one can ever fix it, and they'll never be friends again. It's over. The deeper the knife you can stab in someone's back, the less chance they'll ever reconcile. And we're called to forgiveness. We're called to this. Well, what if someone did this? Then they did it. We can't control them. 
What we can control is our walk with Jesus Christ. We were forgiven for our sins. We were on our way to hell, and he stepped in with his own life. He stepped in with his own life. He bled for the privilege of forgiving you. He bled for the privilege of inviting you to live with him forever. He bled for that until he was dead for that. And then we're like, oh, but he said this. Never going back to that church. Well, if you're there for that, then you're already there for the wrong reason anyway. Go for Jesus Christ. When we sing that last song, if you've got something that's just been stuck in your heart and stuck in your thoughts, stuck in your mind, stuck in your family, someone you're super concerned about, then come up and pray. Make a move. The more you seek him, the more you find him. If you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him. But stop treating this thing like it's nothing. Like it's just salt on the meal. He's the meal. He's not a portion of your life. He is the reason you're alive. And he's your eternal life. You have none outside of him. And you had none when you were born into sin. He died for the privilege to free you. Can you be church hurt? Of course you can. Get over it. It's enough. 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 Are people going to gossip? Of course they are. Do you? You know what the real problem with gossip, my wife and I are talking about this. You know what the problem is? You're giving demons all the ammunition that they need. They cannot read your heart. They can't look inside your head. They can only watch your behavior. The only time they can look inside is when you keep inviting them until the point that you are possessed. But you don't just walk down the street and all of a sudden, it's not what happens. It's, just, it's, it's, not like, it's, not like, it's not like World War Z where you just get bit by another guy with a demon, now you've got one. What happens is you keep giving in to an addiction to anything. Everybody's like, oh, oh, I don't have an addiction. Yeah, you do. We all do. Some be like, oh, I haven't got an addiction. Is lunch break over? Yeah, just a few more minutes. You've got one. You've got idols. That's why Jesus always comes in our lives like he did the temple and flips tables. You've got stuff that doesn't belong there. And the smartest thing you can do is keep going to him like David did and said, if you find any unclean way in me, show it to me and let's, get, let's take care of this mess. Why? Because it's an infection that can kill you if you allow it to grow. So you've got a prison full of people. We've already seen the justice system in this region, yeah. in this nation. We already know it's a mess. So a lot of these guys probably didn't do anything wrong. Other ones did. The ones on both sides of Jesus, the one prisoner goes, look, you and I completely deserve this. So they really did some stuff. <laughs> like we're, we're on a cross. We're nailed to it. We're going to die. We deserve this. You know it. A little thing pecking his head. And, 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 and Jesus, Jesus, please remember me. Ah, ah, we were both insulting you, but now I get it. I get it. Oh, my gosh. Like they knew they deserved it. So there's people in the jail that deserve it. There's people in the jail that don't. The same today. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And other prisoners were listening to them. They're in footstocks that are all spread out. So what should you do? You've been stripped and beaten and you're bleeding and it's midnight. Do you suddenly heal from getting hit with rods until you bleed? No, they're still bleeding. They're sitting here in stocks and they can't move. They're in a cell. They got no hope of getting out of this. They don't know that something's about to happen. They might die right here. This is what I get, God. Oh, my word. 
Why do I, why do, I do this? Why do I come back here? But no. They're singing hymns. They're praying. Yes, my prayer would be, God, I get me out. Shatter their teeth. That's a scripture. I'm using it. But no, no, that's not. They're singing hymns. The other prisoners are listening. The word listening here is with an intent of listening intently. Not like, oh my Lord, the screamer's down in the inner cell. I just wish they'd shut up. Yeah, we get it. We've all had something bad happen to us. Oh, I get it. You're religious zealots. Yeah. They're listening intently. Think about who's there. It's Paul who wrote most of the Bible of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit did, but used him and planted all the churches that he was writing to when he wrote the Bible. Next to him is Silas, who the Bible tells us in Acts is a prophet. He can tell the future because he's got the Holy Spirit in him to do it. So now you've got these two perennial all-stars sitting just a couple rooms over. Man, I, I am so sad that in America, these two could be sitting in the food court near you and people would pick up their food and move to another table. It's super religious. They're telling you the way to be saved. You don't need a demon for that. You can listen to them. You can sense the authority in which the way they spoke and, and other people would move away from them. That's America. They're in a prison and people are listening and they're paying attention like, oh my gosh. Listen to these guys. Listen to what they're saying. Um... I'm not going to pay attention. I don't know if they can sing. They're singing hymns. They might sound terrible. I don't think they're in two-part harmony. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, at one time, at once means in that moment, all the prison doors flew open, everyone's chains came loose. All the prison doors opened. Chick, 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 chick. Everyone's chains come off. What would you do? Any prison, USA. By the way, he calls for lights. It's dark. This is unbelievably perfect. How did this happen? Whose plan was this? Let's go. Everybody, run, run, run. Here's your chance. Such a violent earthquake that every prison door flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up because there's a violent earthquake. You, those wake you up. He saw the prison doors open because a jailer like this would live right there. So you can't, so nobody gets away. You're paying attention. He saw the prison doors open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he thought the prisoners had escaped. He knows Rome's law. Let them go, and whatever was their penalty is now yours. They'll toy with me. They'll be merciless. I don't want to be in their shoes. Uh, I'll kill myself. So understand this. This man just turned suicidal. He's going to kill himself. He just turned suicidal. He's going to take his own life. He's seconds from it. He doesn't see a way out of his problem. 
and he's going to kill himself. I mean, isn't that when, isn't that, when that happens? You, you, you look down the road and you see there's no way that this is going to change. There's nothing that can make this be different. I am so, I'm in so much trouble. Nothing can change this. And it's my own fault. I should have checked those locks twice. I should have, I should have made sure that, that the chains didn't come loose. I, this is my fault. This is my fault. I'm going to take my life. I don't, I don't want to face what I have to, uh, have to face. See, Satan just gearing up, demons whispering. Yeah, take your life, man. Jump on that sword. You know what they'll do to you. But Paul shouted, Don't arm yourself. We're all here. Are you kidding? I would have been like, hey, hey, can I look at that sword? Don't beat me next time. I'm just sharing the gospel. You know, are you kidding me? This is what he does? Don't harm yourself. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Nobody left. Nobody left. A whole bunch of prisoners who just got freed. That's making my eye twitch. What is, what is happening? And nobody left. How could that be? How could this opportunity come and nobody take it? You want to know how? They were so wonderfully saved by what was happening in the inner cell block that they'd rather stay here and be put back in prison but know that God than be anywhere else. Just, can you just keep those two in there so they keep telling us stuff about God? You know, they'd rather, rather than risk running while these two perennial spiritual all-stars are in the room, they'd rather that the jailer clink the locks back up and just keep hearing that. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in. Because they said, don't kill yourself, we're all here. What do you think he's doing while he's rushing and getting the lights? Clink, 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 clink. Well, now they won't, at least they won't get out. I mean, it would be hard to believe that he didn't try to close the doors. Either way, it said he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, brings them out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the guy that beat them. This is the guy that didn't have any compassion or mercy. He's probably most likely a Roman soldier who in his later years got this job because they would do that all the time with former soldiers. They're tough. They've seen a lot. They're pretty grisly. Put him in charge of a prison. He gets a job. He can keep working. Most likely this is what he is. He's seen a lot. And he says, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He's seen everything. He knows he's got no hope. And he just realized, I've been shown mercy. I could live. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. How would he know that unless Silas the prophet said, It'll be your family too. I bet a lot of you have family you hope gets to know. But you don't know if they're going to know. You're praying for it. You're hoping for it. We put names in a box for that. So did I. But you don't know. You can't read their heart. God can. But God speaks to Silas, most likely, being the prophet. He says, your, your whole household will be saved. You, you make this step. It won't just be you. It'll be all of you. At that, oh, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them 
and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Don't forget this thing started at midnight. I don't know what time it is now. I don't know where they went to get baptized. But this is, this is what's happening. This is a whole, like everything's crazy the way this plays out. At the, that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house. He set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household, he went from suicide-driven to Christ-driven. He went from, I'm going to kill myself, to I'm going to live forever. He's full of joy. He's full, he's lit up with joy. God just saved him. He was the only prisoner there. Everyone else didn't run away. They didn't care they were prisoners because they had the king. When I go to prison ministry, there's a church flourishing down at Warren. Flourishing. People on their way to heaven. They've done some really rough things, they'll tell you. But they've been saved and forgiven, and they're on their way to heaven. And there's tons of people just running around, driving their cars, going to work, whatever. They don't know the truth, and they're not. Still in prison, prison, like the jailer. Still working their jobs, still doing their thing, still contemplating suicide. Still, I don't even have any hope. I don't even know where this thing's going. I don't even get it. What, What happens? You just die, I guess? No idea what the truth is. You must invite Jesus into your heart to be saved. You must confess his mouth, with your mouth rather, that he is Lord. You must believe in your heart that he died for your sins, and you will be saved. And if you're like, well, I don't even know how to believe that, then ask him. Seek him with all your heart, and he will get you there. You you can't get there. How do you believe in something you don't understand? He'll make sure you do. You think demons can get in your head? God sure can. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent the officers to the jailer with this order. Release those men. And the jailer told Paul, meaning he put them back in. I'm sorry, guys, but I am a jailer. and you know, I, uh, They'll kill me. Uh, he puts them back in the jail cell. They probably told him, we don't want you to die. That's why I told you not to fall on your sword. We knew. He even says to him, we're all here. Don't kill yourself allows himself to be put back in jail because this guy just got saved. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. You can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens. And probably right there, the jailer was like, "Mm, well, that was me. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) That was me that did that. Uh, even though we're Roman citizens, which nobody knew they were, they have a different set of laws for the citizens. Now, now the magistrates are in trouble because Paul actually literally is a Roman citizen. So is Silas. He's not playing. And then they threw us into prison. And now they want to get rid of us quietly? Nope. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, meaning they did not leave the city yet. <laughs> like, we, we will, we will. We have a stop to make on the way, so you can come with us. they got to get escorted out of town, so why don't you listen to a uh, home fellowship, see what you think of it. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, the one with purple cloth from last week where they met with the brothers and the sisters and encouraged them. Then they left, after the escorts had also heard the gospel. Their motivation is so different. Their motivation is so wildly godlike. Man, I want my motivation to be more like that. I don't want to go through what they went through to get my motivation there. Because I'm human. But boy, I want my motivation to be that. To 
you care enough about other people, that you love enough about uh, people that you know don't love you, that you'd sit in the cell for their freedom like Christ did for us. If nothing else, if nothing else, we've got to figure out forgiveness. We've got to figure it out. We've got to figure out that with the measure that we measure with will be measured. We've got to figure out that we've got to forgive. Even Jesus in his prayer. How do we pray? Like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive others. You hear what he does? We're called to it. And the freedom that comes. Church hurt is real. It's a real thing. But let's stop living there. There are a lot of kinds of hurt that we've overcome through Christ. Why can't we overcome that one? Can I have the band come back up because I want to play that last song again. And I really feel like the Holy Spirit said, seek me with all your heart. Seek me with all your heart. You got something that's not changing? You got something that just stays the same? You got something you're frustrated with? You got something that is super hard and you have no idea how it's going to change? Then put it in his hands by getting on your knees.